Hey guys, welcome back to Delving Into the Cold. This is Dee. Um, so it's the beginning of May, and I did a poll on the uh, Delving Into the Cold website, and you guys voted on the one of the true crime cases to be the Somerton Man case. So that's the case we're going to cover today. Um, this case is also known as the Tamam Should case. And it's one of those cases that when I first heard about it was, it blew my mind. I was just like, this is incredible. This is not incredible in the way that it's really cool, but incredible in the way that there were so few answers. So let's kind of get into it and we'll discuss, um, the scene, the body, um, and a few theories. So, on December 1st, 1948, around 6.30 a.m., uh, police were called to Somerton Beach, Adelaide, Australia, for a man who was propped up against a wall on the beach across from a crippled children's home. And when they got there, they found a guy that was roughly in his late 30s to early 40s, propped up against the wall, his legs were outstretched, his feet, um, were crossed, and, uh, upon further investigation, it was discovered that the man was, in fact, dead. Uh, they thought that maybe he had died in his sleep. Now, on the body itself was, um, a few specific, uh, items there was a cigarette folded into the collar of his coat. There was a rail ticket to Henley Beach and also a bus ticket. There was an aluminum comb, a pack of juicy fruit gum, and um, a cigarette package that had cigarettes that were different uh, from what the package said they were. They weren't the same brand as the package indicated. And a book of matches. So basically a lot of random things that we probably, you know, carry around with us and don't even think about, but nothing that could really identify the guy. And so they started looking for, you know, people who may have seen this guy or may have, uh, known him and they found a couple witnesses. Uh, one witness saw a man the night before around 7 to 8 p.m., and he was lying in the same spot. But they did at one point see him move one arm and then kind of drop it limply, which they thought was a little bit weird, but they kind of just thought that maybe he was drunk. Um, other witnesses reported that, you know, mosquitoes were swarming and that the guy that was there did not at all react to them, which they found weird. Um... One witness reported seeing a man looking down at the, uh, Somerton man, quote-unquote. Um, and another saw a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders. Which is suspicious to me, but again, at the time, the witness thought that it was just a guy that was carrying his drunk friend home. Okay, so let's discuss what the victim looked like and what was um not only on his body but what wasn't on his body and cause of death time of death all that good stuff uh he was approximately five feet 11 inches tall he had slightly graying ginger colored hair and he was very broad his shoulders and chest were broad um, his hands were not calloused, indicating that he didn't work a lot with his hand. He hands. He wasn't a uh, manual laborer, probably. Um, he did have wedge-shaped toes, which indicated to the um, medical examiner that he could possibly be a dancer. And he also had well-defined calves, which leads credence to that theory. He was wearing a white button-up a white and blue tie, brown trousers, a brown knitted pullover, gray and brown double-breasted jacket, and 
none of the clothes that he was wearing had labels. All of the tags had been taken out, which is super strange, but this whole case is strange. Um, he had no wallet on him, so no identification, obviously, or we wouldn't be calling him the Summerton Man, let's be honest. Um, they ran his dental records. It matched no one. According to, uh, the medical examiner's office and the police, he looked, their words, not mine, quote-unquote British. His jawline and, um, the way he dressed and the shape of his body indicated to them that he looked more British than, um, Australian, I guess? I don't know. That was weird to me. Uh... His time of death is estimated to have been about 2 a.m. on December the 1st. And they believed it could have been a suicide, but his um, cause of death was officially barbiturate or hypnotic poisoning. So I had indicated earlier that he had a couple of transportation tickets in his pocket. Well, one of those tickets led to a railway station. Um, and at the railway station on January the 14th, 1949, so about a month after his body was found, uh, a suitcase was located at the railway station. Um, it was connected to him through um, investigation. And uh, there was no labels on anything except... Um, a tie, a laundry bag, and a singlet, which had the, uh, label T. Keen, or some variation of, uh, Keen. And so they're like, we finally know who this guy is, right? Uh, it's a huge lead. Unfortunately, it is not. They, uh, investigated the name and any version of T. Keen, and it led nowhere. But they did find a secret sewn-in pocket in um, one of the, I believe it was a pair of pants that was in the uh, suitcase. And on it, or in it, sorry, was a rolled up piece of paper that said, to mom should. And this translates into finished or it is done um and they eventually you know tracked this piece of paper down to um a book called the rubiot it's at the very end of the book um it ends with the words to mom should and so that was strange to investigators because um it was just a single piece of paper. It wasn't any indication of who the guy might be, but it also kind of leads credence to the suicide theory. And on the back of this piece of paper were random letters. Um, and I say random because no sense was ever made of them. They could mean something to the victim. But unfortunately, he's not here to tell us. So to everybody else, it's pretty just pretty much just random. Um, now the Rubiot that the paper came from was eventually turned into police by, and this was like I think over a year later when it was turned in by a guy who said that he was on Somerton Beach on the day uh, of the summer man's uh, death. And that when he got back in his car, someone had uh, dropped the book in his back seat through his rolled down window. Um, they found a phone number in the back of the book that belonged to Jessica Thompson, or Thompson, sorry, who lived close to um, Somerton Beach. Uh, and at this point, they had done everything they could to identify the man. They had had public viewings. They had put his face all over the media. And no one had identified him. So they had eventually buried him, but they made a bust of his head. And when they showed it to Jessica, 
She was just in complete shock, but she tried to play it off. She claimed that she gave the book away during World War II. Um, and so they tracked the book, quote unquote, that she had given away. Um, and it wasn't the one that the quote had been taken from. The one that they found had been whole. And obviously the guy that she had given it to, they're like, oh, we finally have an identification for the uh, Somerton man. But it wasn't. The guy that she gave the book to was alive and well. He, um, he turned out not to be the Somerton man, which was really sad. They thought that they had finally figured out who he was, and it was another dead end. Alright, guys. Let's talk about some theories now. Uh, I've already discussed the suicide theory. Um, there's a lot of credence to that. Other to me, other than the fact that he went about it in such a mysterious way so that people wouldn't be able to identify him. And I mean, I guess maybe that was his prerogative. He didn't want people to know who he was. But uh, that's the only caveat to me of that theory is that he purposefully made it harder for people to know who he was. Um, another theory is that he was murdered by someone, in which, if you recall, one of the witnesses saw someone carrying a man over his shoulders. So that's a strong theory to me. Um, his COD was barbiturate poisoning, and so someone could have easily slipped him something in a drink or in food, because the last thing he had in his stomach was um, a meat-filled pastry. So, that's a strong possibility, but probably the most well-known theory about the Somerton Man is that he was a spy. Um, and if you'll realize what time frame that this guy died in, it was post-World War II. Um, political tensions were extremely high, and I mean, this guy essentially did not have an identification. He um, died by barbiturate poisoning again, and that's something that uh, a lot of spies at the time did so that they, you know, wouldn't be caught. Um, and he, you know, purposefully made it so that people couldn't identify him. So that's a strong theory. And if, and it, and if he was indeed uh, foreign to Australia, that leads more credence to the theory. So that's the theory that, while far-fetched, I'm going to go with. Because he, uh, it just fits best to me, I think. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky case. Unfortunately, it's been 71 years, and we still don't have answers to that. Alright guys, that's all i got for you today. Stay safe, stay curious, and I'll see you next time.